Riotsuit. Hi, it's Itsies. Welcome to Spooky Saturdays. I'm Mimi. If you're new here, welcome to the Tootsie family. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for your continued support. You and the new subscribers and everyone else is always welcome here. Can we just talk about my shirt for a minute? It says t Rexorcist, and then the picture is of a T-Rex, like if he was the priest. Come on. This is one of my favorite t-shirts to wear. So on Thursday, we read parts three and four of this series. And today we're gonna dive in to part five. And I actually saw that there is a part six and I'm not sure how long the series is, but we are definitely gonna finish it here on my channel. Not today. Ain't nobody got time for that today. But we will be reading part five. So if you're ready to get spooky, let's get to it. There's a strange newspaper that's only delivered at midnight. Part five. It was Friday night, 10 to midnight. I knew that right now, the newest edition of the midnight paper would be hitting my parents' welcome mat in a few moments but I wasn't there. I decided after last time that I wasn't going to be reading the next article. What if it contained something worse than the hunger? I couldn't let it become real. I didn't want any more blood on my hands. I sat at the rickety table included in my motel room. Every time I hit a key on my laptop, the table rattled tilting toward its short leg which I couldn't identify for the life of me. I didn't mind. I was counting the minutes with each time I hit refresh on the search page of Herrick's High School's website. On the search bar was the name Stephanie Carson. I got the midnight paper with the ledge game article on Friday, September 11th at midnight. One week later, on Friday, September 18, at midnight, I had witnessed a girl jumping off a building to end her life. I read the midnight paper with the removal doctor article on Wednesday, September 16, at midnight. One week later, on Wednesday, September 22, at midnight, I had first heard about the removal doctor on the local news. That means that it takes one week between getting a midnight paper and the article in it becoming true. If I was right, that night at midnight, Stephanie Carson would become real. She'd suddenly appear in the Herricks High School website as if she was always enrolled there. No memorial service, no news about a tribute or a plaque going up in her honor. Just a page or two about the school's most gifted student. Midnight. Just as I hit refresh, I heard three knocks at my motel room door. What? No, it couldn't. But it was. I opened my door and there, on the patch of filthy rug right in front of my room was a bundle of black paper bound in black twine. I grabbed a plastic bag that held the snacks I'd bought at the gas station, put on a pair of rubber gloves, and grabbed a pair of grill tongs. The midnight paper dangled off the teeth of the tongs. Its strange electricity still somehow crackling through the rubber and making the hairs on my hands stand up. I dropped the paper into the plastic bag and tied it into a knot. Then I dropped that bag into another two bags for good measure. 
and toss them into a dumpster by the ice machine. By the time I got back, the shitty motel internet had finally loaded the page. 10 results for Stephanie Carson. I gripped the sides of the shitty motel table. Would I be too late? Was it tonight? A few minutes later, I opened my motel room door cautiously. The patch of filthy carpet was empty. No new midnight paper. I smiled. Maybe I'd gotten rid of it entirely. Maybe not reading one was all it took for it to just leave you alone. I went right to the dumpster. The bags I'd hidden the midnight paper in were still there. They hadn't mysteriously vanished. I nodded and got in my car. By the time I got to the right part of town, the night was cold and bright. Street lights glinted off of every surface, bouncing off a thousand reflective surfaces and zeroing in on my eyes. The migraine was back in full swing. I was a little used to it by now. I chugged a bit more of my soda and narrowed my eyes. I had a long night ahead of me. I stopped the car and unplugged my phone from its stand on the dashboard. On the screen was something I wasn't proud of at all. Stephanie Carson's Instagram account. It had taken me less than an hour to find it. I won't write it here. But her username was a simple combination of her name and her volleyball jersey number. It wasn't set to private either. A little scrolling had led me to a photo of Stephanie and her friends in front of a house that could only be described as excessive. It was as close to Cinderella's castle as you could get while still being attached to a sidewalk. I didn't know the exact address, but there was a photo of her in front of a street sign with the same group of friends, wearing the same clothes as before. It was easy to guess that they had taken the photo in front of Stephanie's house and the photo of the street sign back to back. That same street sign was in front of me now, and a few feet away from it was Cinderella's castle itself. And one of the lights upstairs was on. I walked around the block more than a few times, trying to get my story straight. I had to warn Stephanie about Mark Bailey, who she already knew about. But then she'd ask me how I knew what I did and I was still working that part out. I could show her my post on here, but knocking on a girl's door and telling her that I'd posted on Reddit about her murder? Yeah. No, I'd be in a straight jacket before morning. Whatever. I didn't need to make sense. I didn't even need to tell her about the posts. I could simply knock on the door and tell her that I'd driven by and seen a strange man peering through her windows. She'd think I'd spotted Bailey and would probably call the cops on him. Problem solved. Then why not call the cops myself? Because they'd ask questions. She would too. <sighs> I sighed. There was seemingly no way to do this without looking as creepy as Mark Bailey himself. I walked up to the front door held my breath, and knocked. The sound seemed explosive in the darkness, but that was probably just the lateness of the hour amplifying every sound times 100. Still no sound or movement or light came from inside. I knocked again, a little louder this time. A few seconds later, nothing had changed. I was out of options. I bit the bullet and stabbed the doorbell with my finger. The electronic chime echoed through the house, about as subtle as the carpet bombing. One light went on, two, then the whole first floor lit up. 
I heard muted little footsteps from behind the door as if someone was walking on a carpet. Then the latch turned and the door swung open and something hit me on the head. Wake up, creeper, a girl's voice said. I opened my eyes then shut them immediately. The brief glimpse of the world I got in had been enough. It was white and blurred. Something cold and hard collided with my cheek, shooting fireworks across my vision. I said, wake up! I opened my eyes again. This time, the world was a little less blurry. I blinked until the person in front of me came into focus. There, holding what looked like some kind of metal sculpture, was Stephanie Carson. There you are, she said matter-of-factly. I was worried I'd hit you a little too hard. So, want to tell me why you've been walking outside my house for the past hour and a half? Mark Bailey, I said, my voice raspy and a little more than a whisper. There was a metallic taste in my mouth that seemed to extend into my lungs. Jesus, maybe she had hit me a little too hard. Oh great, my stalker has a friend. No, not a friend. He's going to kill you, tonight. That had come out a little more clearly. I would have been pleased with myself, but it was around that time that I noticed that I couldn't feel my hands. One looked down and I could see why. My wrists were stuck to the arms of a chair with a ridiculous amount of duct tape. Geez, had she used one roll for each hand? Then Stephanie said something that made me forget about how my hands were already turning purple. I know. What? I asked my voice sounding distant and slow, as if it was coming from a broken speaker on the other side of the room. He's been stalking me for a long time. He broke in last week, and I got a restraining order out on him. He's close to figuring it out, I can tell. He's close to losing his shit, too. It's gonna get violent. Whatever. I figure if anyone's going to do it, it might as well be him. I thought back to something Mark Bailey had said in the article. Something I thought had just been in the ramblings of a convicted murderer. Stephanie had gotten loose and had stood next to the kitchen knives instead of running away. Like she was inviting Bailey to use them on her. I cleared my throat. Aren't you going to stop him? Don't you want to? Stephanie rolled her eyes like I was annoying her. Scratch the like. I was annoying her. I'll come back anyway. Well, not me. But it doesn't really matter. It might make my parents look back at me. This version of me. Twice. Now we just gotta figure out what to do with you. If my RNs get back, they'll get rid of you. And stick you in an acid barrel. What? Aren'ts? They're what I call the fake parents that live here. Like, aren't my parents? Get it? They're drones. Mindless versions. Not the real deal. Do I have to explain everything to you? So, if I cut you loose, will you leave quietly? But, what about Mark? Oh, screw Mark Bailey. What does it even matter? You think I'm the first one of me to die? The first one to want to? I was speechless. That was the last thing I expected her to say. I can't feel my hands, I said finally. Stephanie nodded. She grabbed a pair of scissors from the desk next to her. And that was the first time I thought to look around. The walls were white, clinical. There were tables upon tables filled with lab equipment around us. It was like a high-end research lab, the kind of place that might be responsible 
for creating a deadly virus, for resurrecting dinosaurs, or making multiple versions of the same teenage girl. Stephanie cut the tape around my wrists. I winced. The blood shooting back through my bruised wrist felt like acid. You can't let Bailey kill you, I said, rising slowly. Who are you anyway, a teacher at Roslyn? Didn't you go to Roslyn, I asked. No, that was Monica and Natalie. Stupid of them to send two of us to the same school, right? No wonder Bailey lost her marbles. So you're not the same person. Wow, you're all questions, aren't you? You haven't even answered mine. I told her my name, then went about explaining everything I could about the midnight paper and my post online. I let her read through them on my phone. It was then that I saw it, that strange intelligence that Bailey had mentioned. Her face came alive and I could almost see millions of hyper complex gears turning in her mind. Wormhole might explain it, she said finally. Then she shook her head, scratched that. Simulation. Wormhole was stupid. Only, hmm, you said you got a paper tonight, right? And that it was still in the dumpster? Yeah, I said, catching up. Let me take a look at it. I, I don't think it's a good idea. Neither was touching the effing thing. Breathing its fumes or trying to burn it, Stephanie said. Yeah, I guess you have a point. We moved from one room in the basement to another, and I saw the shelves filled with the occult books that Mark Bailey had mentioned. Those are mine, Stephanie said. Can't rule anything out, right? I shrugged, not sure what she was talking about. Then I checked my phone, and my heart stopped. 4 a.m. Mark Bailey was due any second. Stephanie didn't seem to notice. She was moving so fast she was practically a blur. By the time I had gotten to the foot of the stairs, she was already in the kitchen. That was when I heard it. A man's voice. Mark Bailey's voice. What are you? He asked. You're Monica. Then as quickly as it had appeared, Bailey's voice was cut short. I rushed up the stairs and slid into the kitchen. There on the tile floor, Mark Bailey lay in a pool of his own blood. His neck was cut open. Stephanie tossed a bloody knife into the sink. Don't worry, she said. My aunts will take care of this. Where'd you park your car? It was almost dawn by the time we were standing in front of the dumpster. I pulled the plastic bags out and cut them open slowly with a pair of scissors from the lab. Stephanie's face lit up the second she saw the black bundle roll out. Before I could stop her, she ripped the twine off and unrolled the paper. Then she frowned. She turned the paper toward me. Can you read it? She asked. I nodded. I can't see anything. Just black paper. No words written in white ink. I bet whoever appears in the articles can't read them. Because I'm not real. The paper must have created me like you thought. She was actually smiling as she said that. Doesn't that bother you? No, are you kidding me? I'm thrilled. I'd much rather be created by a mysterious newspaper than by my parents. Read it to me, she ordered. Some of the words were already being erased, but I read the article to her anyway. This is what it said. The perfect being? Experts call aerial phenomenon easy to explain. It's only been two days, but the residents of a small town in upstate New York have already grown accustomed to it. 
There's a strange shape in the sky that isn't going away, and it looks like a person. The event began sometime after dawn on blank morning. It's now blank, and the clouds aren't going anywhere. It's not just the shape, says blank, a lifelong resident of blank. There's light in there, like no matter how dark it gets, there's something in there that's shining, like the sun. The apparition is certainly uncanny. It's a little shape that looks like a person in the sky. It has all the parts you'd expect. A head, two arms, complete with their hands, and two legs, plus their feet. The arms and legs are pointed at an angle so that, the, so that they make an X. It looks like the Da Vinci Man, one woman said. She's not the only one. Many people have drawn the comparison between the man-shaped object and da Vinci's iconic Vitruvian man. If this was only an oddly shaped object, it wouldn't have made as big of an impact on the residents. Indeed, there's a strange glow to it, as if it reflects the sunlight in such a way that the entire human shape is lit up at once. When the sun goes down, the glow remains shining like a big star that often hides behind thick clouds. This is an age where everyone has a smartphone in their pocket, a gadget that doubles as an expensive camera. So why haven't you heard of this before? The answer is simple. It's too far away. It's about the size of a fingernail, a resident explained. Just hold your little finger up to the sky and imagine something floating up there that's as big as the nail. That's not very big at all. A photography expert explained that most phone cameras aren't particularly good at taking photos of something that small at a distance, especially against a bright sky. As a result, most of the images that have made their way to social media show a blurry speck against a blazing white sky. At night, the results are even worse. At best, capturing a circle of light, at worst, simply showing a dark sky. Meteorologists, astronomers, and aficionados of aerial phenomenon have indeed regarded the apparition as a trick of the light. I think it's a kite, said a local man who owns a high-end telescope. Some kind of man-shaped kite that someone let go of. Maybe it's a prank. A meteorologist stated that it's easy to explain. It could be any number of things, ranging from drones to homemade balloons. It's nothing natural though, certainly not a meteor and definitely not a sign of the end times. So how exactly did this apparition become known as the perfect being? A local news station was interviewing a group of onlookers when they were approached by a strange man. There was something off about him for sure, stated Blank, a veteran field reporter who isn't shaken up by weirdos. He just walked up to the camera when we were interviewing another eyewitness and saying that he made it and that it's the perfect being. A weirdo, a kook. We get too many to count, but it caught on, mostly because people were making fun of the guy. The strange aerial phenomenon known as the perfect being still hasn't disappeared from the sky. Far from it. It's actually gotten a little bigger. It's like it's getting closer, said another resident, dropping down slowly, like it's falling. Some residents have taken it upon themselves to study the steady rate of decline in a scientific manner. If it keeps dropping at this current rate, it'll be down in about a week, says a young girl who looks about as serious as someone working for NASA. It won't drop here. It'll drop the next town over. We'll just have to wait and see if this amateur astrologer is right on the money. When I was done reading, Stephanie was smiling again. What does it mean? I asked already getting used to relying on her superior intelligence? Nothing much. 
just that we've got a doctor's appointment, she said. And that is the end of part five. So tell me, what are your guys' thoughts on part five of this series? I was wondering why he went to the girl's house. In my mind, immediately, when we read part four, was it part four or part three, when we read about Stephanie Carson and Mark Bailey, and um, Mark Bailey was telling his story, I was like, yeah, the girl, there's something wrong with the girl. I didn't think that he went crazy and, you know, he was just making up a story. So, like, I believed Mark Bailey. So, the author, I was like, what are you doing? Why are you going to this girl's house? She's clearly crazy. So, it was interesting to me that he believed her and he was trying to warn her um, instead of Mark Bailey. So, that's kind of crazy. Um, and it's interesting that him and this girl have partnered up now so it's this is getting really interesting it's getting really good um so i'm excited to keep this series going i probably won't be doing a back-to-back -back reading like this um going forward but i will still continue to read these stories so if you want to keep up you have to be subscribed to my channel you have to hit your notification bell so that you know when i post the next time and that is it for this video, guys. Like I said, please subscribe. Hit that post notification so you know when I upload. Click the thumbs up. If you don't like the video, click the thumbs down. I don't really care. And let's chat in the comments. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear what you guys think about this story so far. It, I thought it was only four parts, and I was completely wrong. So obviously, the story has lots of parts to it, and... I want to read it with you guys till it end so drop me a comment down in the com comment box below and let me know your thoughts on this story and where you think it's gonna go all right you guys i will see you in the next video bye <laughs>